Thank you for joining us for the reintroduction of Native Americans into Illinois. I'm Jamie, the program coordinator at the Deerfield Public Library, and I would like to welcome Gerald Savage, Ho-Chunk Native mm -hmm. American, who is here to examine the history of his tribal territory and how his family was relocated into Stark Rock. This was the uh, Hayward Residential School in Wisconsin. Uh, like I say, my grandmother's whole family was taken. So she was not the oldest, but she, uh, she had an older sister, an older brother, her. So when you go to the residential school, you dress like this here. You're not allowed to speak your native language. And behind the school, there are unmarked graves. So I had a, a grade schooler ask me, why are there graves out back? I go, well, people died. Uh, some might have been from punishment and some might have been from sickness, but they just buried them in a, a plot grave out back. They're unmarked. Like I say, my grandfather and grandmother met in a Wild West show, not necessarily this one, but they did the Native American portion of the Wild West show. They, uh, my grandfather was the MC and my grandmother was one of the dancers and they traveled all over the U.S., while while they were out on uh, doing the Wild West show, they met a very charismatic man, and uh, that man uh, asked if my grandfather would be interested in moving to Illinois. And uh, my grandfather, he, you know, he's skeptical at the time. He goes, "Well, let me see the property you're talking about, the land you're talking about." And he brought him down to a Star Rock, and he showed him uh, showed him some of the property. This is a picture of my grandfather right around that time. If you look at the, uh, the picture here, my grandfather, my grandfather, my uh, deceased uncle, and they're, they're all deceased, but uh, I want to point in particular to Junior here. Junior died of racism. You know, it's, it's hard to say it, say it any otherwise. Junior passed away from, uh, he had an appendicitis attack and they wouldn't take him at the hospital because they, they knew my grandfather had, and he had dark skin and they wouldn't take him because they knew my grandfather couldn't pay. So they denied him service there. Uh, one of the local churches stepped up, said they would pay the bill, but by then it was too late. He died of sepsis and he was only 10 years old at the time. So... Well, that charismatic man said, uh, I can get you a job. They're just finishing up with the uh, Star Rock Lodge. The CCC was building the Star Rock Lodge here. This is the old Star Rock Hotel. Star Rock is over here. Here's uh, uh, Devil's Nose over here. And when I was named, I was named right here. And I'll talk about this circular drive right here. That'll come up in the future. My, uh, my, grandpa my grandfather... He put a postcard out, and this is after Junior died. There's my uncle, Haina, uh, my mother, and this was before my one auntie. So my grandfather, he was still a showman. He always put a teepee up to make sure that uh, to draw people in. We'll jump up to 1962 to jump from 35. Oh, and that very charismatic man that moved uh, my grandparents into Star Rock, his name was uh, Governor Henry Horner. He, uh, back then, governors had a lot of unchecked power, and he actually let my grandfather move into the, uh, right, right about here into the woods, my grandfather built a house in, inside the park. So we'll jump to the uh, the 1962 part. In 1962, they had my naming at Star Rock. That's Chief Floyd White Eagle. There's me, and there's my grandfather, Chief Walks with the Wind. If you look at the uh, picture here, oh, well, maybe. <laughs> my, my father, my mother, my uncle, there's me, the little one and my grandfather at the naming ceremony at Star Rock. When they had the naming ceremony at Star Rock, they said that uh, 40,000 people came to the park that day, and they parked from five miles out and walked all the way in. 
it was very well advertised. We had over 30 tribes represented at that powwow for the naming. Uh, it was a very, very solemn event at the time. And I'll talk about naming right quick. We have our naming ceremony is much like you probably think it is. Uh, Chief White Eagle, he looked at uh, my mother, my father, my uncle, and he's seen a lot of white skin. And uh, like I say, racism was really big back then. And everybody didn't want to have dark skin. So they went ahead, stayed inside a lot, got real light skin. Well, when Chief White Eagle did the naming, he looked at all the white skin, and he called me White Winnebago. Uh, the name of the tribe back until 1964 was the Winnebago uh, business community in Wisconsin. So we were Winnebago tribe then. We changed the name of our tribe to Ho-Chunk in 1964. Part of our tribal territory, when uh, Nicolette came and met with us, uh, what we call Red Banks, but today it's commonly known as Green Bay. Uh, there must have been an algae bloom going on at that time, because uh, if you know anything about algae blooms, they don't smell the greatest. And the word Winnebago in Algonquin means people of the stinky water. So we changed our name to our original name, Ho-Chunk. So we're not, the, we're not the people of the stinky water. We're people of the big voice or people of the mother tongue. So I kind of want to talk about that also. Uh, we, we will go ahead and I say we are, they call my Ho-Chunk language a Siouan language which white historians have probably got that one. But uh, when Nicolette came across in the 1620s and met our people, he had Jesuit priests that stayed with the tribe. And they documented the Sauk tribe was split off of our tribe and sent to the west and south. And the Fox tribe, same way, they were split off from us. So they were actually part of the Ho-Chunk Nation. So that was documented. If you look at the language, our language is the same as the Sioux language, the Sauk language, the Fox language, the Meskwaki, the Iowa. So what I think happened, uh, the archaeologists in Wisconsin have the Ho-Chunk people dated back to, I think it was right around 6,000 B.C., as we were one of the original mound builders. Up in Wisconsin, we, we do effigy mounds. We don't do the mounds like the, the Mississippian mounds, like in Southern Illinois. So we're a little bit different, but we probably practiced that same thing all those years where if the tribe got too big, they would have themselves and send them to the West or to the South. So that, uh, like I say, that history was probably written by a white man who didn't understand the language at the time and the history of how the tribe split itself off. So it was had been going on quite a few quite a few years. This was the uh, picture of the crowd here, and if you look at all the chiefs that are over there, and uh, some of the crowd, my grandfather was a very enterprising person, where he would uh, come on up here and sit down. You'll get a better. <laughs> He was a very enterprising person. You see the crowd that's at the park there for that naming ceremony. And if you know anything about state parks, you can't charge admission to come into the state park. So he would put a blanket down. And in my grandfather's words, feel free to throw in a five or a 50. <laughs> and this is back in 1962. So he always thought big. <laughs> Oh, and uh, let me mention right away that humor is very big with our native people. So <laughs> we had a naming ceremony right around uh, two years ago. Um, my sister passed away. And one of her last wishes, she was my younger sister by about uh, eight years. One of her last wishes was to have her daughter named. So we went ahead and had uh, a naming ceremony put together. We got all the permission from the tribe. We had uh, all the right elders show up. We had a drum show up. We did this at Star Rock Lodge. And you see the crowd is a pretty good sized crowd. So we drew in standing room only, basically. 
The elder that named my uh, niece is off uh, off to the right there, uh, Cleland Goodbear. And it's, uh, this dress here was my mother's buckskin dress. She was uh, wearing that. If you look at some of the, her regalia, one of her aunties made the, the hair tie here. I made her necklace over here. So, and uh, I'll talk about her regalia here in a little bit. But uh, we had another chief from uh, Wisconsin come down and help out. Uh, Elliot, uh, <laughs> uh, shoot, I forget what. And then we had the drum over here. So we had a pretty good crowd show up for this. It was a very good day. Are there any veterans in the group here? Anybody in the military? Well, thank you for your service. And when we do ceremonies for Native Americans, if you'll notice the eagle feather staff, that's the Native American flag. And at every ceremony that we have, we honor our veterans. We, by uh, That's the beginning of the ceremony. We will start the ceremony by having a veterans dance and song. And we encourage all of the veterans to come out and dance to be recognized. That's a that's a standard thing at every Native American ceremony that we do. So we're very proud of our, our veterans. The last time there was a naming ceremony at the Starbrock Lodge was in the late 40s, early 50s. I can't be positive on this date because everybody has passed on <laughs> and there's nobody left to tell the history. Most of our history is an oral history. So I can date it because my aunt, She's passed on also, but uh, she was the youngest daughter in my my uh, grandfather's family. She was a Weeha. If you look here, there's my grandfather. Here's the uh, the manager of the lodge. We lent him a bonnet. There's my grandmother, my aunt. I'm not sure who the young men were. I think this was my Uncle Haina. And then I'm not sure who the chiefs were. So uh, that was in, uh, like I say, late 40s, early 50s. We'll talk about regalia. We don't call them costumes, it's regalia. Uh, and this I, this I kind of drum into the young people. You don't like being made fun of, do you? <laughs> nah, nobody likes being made fun of. When we see people dressed up in, in Native American regalia, and they didn't, they don't know the real meaning of the regalia that they wear, it's uh, kind of insulting to many of my native relatives. They get uh, kind of upset, as, as I do also. So I always try to tell a lot of the students to be careful. Don't do that at Halloween. It's very disrespectful. So here's a picture of my cousins in their outfit and a picture of me. Uh, like I say, regalia, not costumes. So I want to try to be sure to tell everybody that what we have on is regalia. What I have on right now, I have a fur chieftain's turban. So this is what a woodland chief would wear. I am a bear clan chief. I have a bear claw necklace. If you guys want to feel it after the program, these claws are not sharp. So it tells you the power of the bear. I have a star pendant that has porcupine quill around it. And then uh, if you see my bone breastplate, my bone choker, back in the early days, we had buffalo and we had deer that we hunted primarily around here. So we've extincted most of the buffalo. We had a woodland buffalo that's completely extincted, but he wasn't, they weren't quite as big as the plains buffalo. But east of the Mississippi, we used to have woodland buffalo. So there's a... Uh, there's talk that they're trying to regenerate some of those if they can, but um, I'll see it when I, I believe it when I see it, probably not in my lifetime. So <clears throat> the, uh, when we, what I have on here would have been old time bulletproof vest, let's say that. You've noticed I have a bone choker on and a bone breastplate. So you wouldn't get gored in any of your, uh, your stomach or your neck, your two most sensitive parts that would kill you, they would wear these. 
and even when they would go to war, you know, to stop a knife or something like that. So that's there was a reason why they wore these, and these were made of bone. So and they were weaved together with uh, leather from the deer. I have uh, a buckskin shirt on with trade beads. So yeah, that uh, a lot of the different things of regalia that I do wear. About seven years ago, I had given a great honor. I was, uh, my uncle said he needed a few minutes and uh, he did. Uh, I gave him a few minutes and he gave me my bonnet. This is a chieftain's bonnet. Uh, call me a little slow. Oh, let me see, I think I messed this up here. There we go, we're back. Um, back in 1985, my grandfather passed away, Chief Walks with the Wind. And I didn't realize it at the time. My grandmother asked me if I wanted my grandfather's bonnet. And I said, uh, no. No, my grandfather, that's his bonnet. He earned it. He gets buried with it. Well, that set the wheels in motion. My grandmother started putting eagle feathers away for me. So in order for me to carry my eagle feathers, I have to have my tribal ID with me at all times. Because if you don't, anybody, if you guys had an eagle feather, you could be arrested and taken to jail. So it's that serious of a crime because the eagles were endangered for quite a long time. They're making a big comeback now, but they're still endangered and they're sacred to the Native Americans. So... Like I said, I didn't realize it until it was in my 40s that our tribe is a matriarchal society, which means the women have quite a bit of power. My grandmother was a clan uh, mother. So the way it works in our tribe, my grandfather, chief walks with the wind. His eldest daughter's first boy becomes the next chief, which would have been me. So that's how that works in our tribe. So uh, chiefs are given out uh, for things that they do also. So it's not always that way. But uh, the clan mothers had a lot of say in our tribe, especially when it came to warring with another tribe. They had the ultimate say because they had so much to lose. So uh, the, our women were hard workers because we were uh, farmers, uh, fishermen, hunters, uh, trappers. We did all kinds of stuff for trade goods with the first French people that came through here. You guys were in the, the fur mecca of the world here. Uh, before, uh, before we dammed everything up and all that, we had all these sloughs. And a lot of the wildlife really enjoyed being in the sloughs. And we were able to trap the otter, the beaver, the raccoons, uh, all of that to trade with the French. The French loved all the pelts. So they made these little trading posts. There was a trading post not too far from here called, uh, uh, it was trading post Dearborn in the beginning. And then Chicago wasn't said as Chicago, it was Chicago. <laughs> so it's everything's kind of changed over time. It's like my grandfather talked about how the white people had changed. Let me get out front here and talk about my moccasins. They, uh, he said the white people changed the name of the moccasins. They're, originally, they were called magasinins, so, but uh, they shortened it up to moccasins. So <laughs> that's uh, some of the things that they've shorted in the names. And then when we did, like, say, back in with the names, in the 1850s, they got, they rounded up all of the Native Americans and registered us. So if they couldn't pronounce your name, they drew a name out of the hat for you. So if you uh, see some of our Native people's names, they're not the traditional uh, Thunderbirds and White Eagles and uh, Decoras and Winnishicks. Uh, you know, we have Quackenbush, we have, uh, <laughs> you know, just uh, whatever name my grandfather was signed, that was a drawn out name also. So it was uh, a lot of names were hybrid, let's say that. 
So, but like I say, I was given this honor way back about seven years ago. The honor of wearing this bonnet comes with a lot of responsibility also. I not only have to take care of my relatives, but I have to take care of some of the tribal members also. I'm very uh, cognizant of that because I've been very fortunate my whole life. So when we have things for our youth at our tribal office, I always make sure that I am the anonymous donor. <laughs> so that way they can't. I don't want them coming to me for money. You got to talk to the tribal office. So <laughs> it's good to remain anonymous sometimes. Back to the uh, the naming ceremony. My uh, uncle took the floor after I got my bonnet, and I had just got done telling everybody about how I got my name, White Winnebago. And uh, he goes, well, I don't quite remember it going that way. He goes, I remember talking with Chief White Eagle before the, uh, the naming ceremony, and if you remember the picture, he was a little older. And uh, he goes, he was talking about... Uh, touring the country to go see all the sites. And he was going to go tour the country and he was going to buy a new RV. Well, remember that circular drive I was talking about? I was named right off of there. Well, lo and behold, he says, at the time of your naming, what comes around that circular drive was a brand new white Winnebago. <laughs> yeah, that was his version. He was, he was, uh, oh, he always had a good sense of humor. <laughs> So we have uh, Native American manhood rights. The Cherokee have a manhood right where they would take the young man out into the woods and blindfold him and leave him by himself. And, and like I say, with the military guys, you guys remember your first night in boot camp? There was probably a little crying going on in them barracks. You know, don't be ashamed to say, yeah, you might have heard it. But uh, the Sioux tribe, they practice piercing their skin with deer antlers and hanging from a tree for uh, an amount of time. I'm not sure. But they still practice some of this today. Our tribe, what we do at 13 years old, you go into the woods for a week with what you can carry. At 13 years old, I was pretty savvy, I thought. I thought I can do this pretty easy. So I pack uh, my little backpack up. I had some Denny Moore beef stew, and I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm going to be king in the week. I'm going to be kicking back and relaxing and not have to cut grass or nothing like that. So I go into the woods for a week. I, got, uh, I think I brought one blanket. That was it. Uh, so that night, that first night comes along, every noise in them woods you didn't know what it was. Mom and dad weren't there to save you. You did a lot of growing up that first night. So that first night, it's like your first night in boot camp. You know, your Uncle Sam's clay after that. Mom and dad ain't coming to save you. So it's uh, it was a very, a very uh, growing up time where it was part of, uh, and that's how the military makes men out of our young people. Uh, responsible young men. <clears throat> they they did this to me too. Like say at 13 years old, you're not the best planner. Comes to be about the third day and I realize I don't have any water. So I uh, I have to go and find some water. I knew there was a swamp down below. I went down to the swamp. And if anybody's been in a swamp in the summertime, you know the horse flies that are around. So I'm running through the woods and I look like I'm a crazy person batting my arms left and right. And just, it, it was just, I can imagine if somebody was around, they would have thought I was a crazy person. Well, I found the source of the water. I did things a little backwards. I didn't have a water vessel. So, but I knew where the source was now. So I knew there was a set of railroad tracks a couple miles away. I walked down to the railroad tracks and I figure, well, I'll just walk the railroad tracks because I know how some people like to litter. And sure enough, about a mile down the tracks, I found a, a milk jug. Fortunately, my picture wasn't on the side. 
<laughs> That's like I say, the young people never get that joke. So, <laughs> so I had a water vessel. I was pretty well set for that week. It always kind of upsets me a little bit when people complain about the taste of water. Water is very sacred amongst the Native American people. So when they talk about the taste of water being bad, I, I always think them people have never been without water then. So water is very sacred. Like say, water is the most sacred medicine the creator gave to us. If you don't believe it, talk to your mother. And you women who've had children, you know the importance of clean water. We all come from clean water. So, uh, I, you know, I hate to press that enough, but you've seen the big protests that we had at the, uh, the pipelines. We don't want pipelines running through our clean water source. We have to look out for our tribal people. We look out for seven generations ahead. We want to make sure that we look that far ahead. It's not just our kids and their grandkids, but the grandkids, grandkids. So we, we look that far ahead and we try to. The plastic bottles. The question I always ask the, the kids in school, how long do you think it takes for this to biodegrade? A thousand years. I go, how long do you think, how do you think it tastes? Probably not too good. It's made of uh, petroleum products. So you'll get some residual things. We don't want to poison ourselves. By putting this into the ground now, we're poisoning our future peoples. So we have to try to think about the seventh generation. And this is my little environmental speech where I tell you, recycle. Please recycle. Recycle as much as you can. Uh, if you see the passenger side of my truck, uh, these plastic bottles, I wad them up and throw them on the floor and put them in my recycle bin. Uh, even when I'm at some other place, they'll see the water bottles left behind. I'll take them and I don't want them to go in the garbage. I want them to go in the recycle bin. So it's that important that we all do this. In my Ho-Chunk language, uh, we have some common names. The firstborn boy is a kunu, the second boy is a hena, the third boy is a haga, the fourth born is nagi, fifth born is nagizunu, and the same with the women. The firstborn woman is a hinu, second born is a weha, third born is haxiga, fourth born heneke, and fifth born haxiga zunu. So when we go to a powwow, we go to one of our ho chunk powwows. Uh, grandma will turn around and she'll yell, hey, Kunu, about 50 heads will turn. Uh, because when grandma speaks, we all listen. So it's, grandmas still hold a very important part in our tribal, in our tribal way. The pipe. Let me, uh, what, what do you what do you call this? What kind of pipe is it? Peace pipe. Who, who said peace pipe? Okay. Even my own people get it wrong. <laughs> These are prayer pipes. Uh, when the white man first met the natives, we sat down and we prayed for peace. That's why it got the name peace pipe. But they're actually prayer pipes. This one here is a uh, Star of Rock ceremonial pipe. Yeah, we don't use it that often. Uh, but if you look at the the stone, the red the red pipe stone, this is called the blood of Mother Earth. So we uh, you can quarry this. Well, you can't. The Native Americans, we can quarry it in Pipestone, Minnesota. Uh, I have a little story about that. Um I had a vision one day to go up to Pipestone to quarry Pipestone. And uh, in order to quarry Pipestone, we have to have our tribal IDs and register at the park. It's a federal park. And I took my son with me. He was a good baseball player at the time. And 
he hit a lot of home runs in that. And I had my sledgehammers with us and all that. And I talked to the uh, park superintendent when I get there. And he tells me, uh, uh, whatever you do, don't give away any pipe stone. And uh, just hang out. I have to get the pit that we're going to quarry the pipe stone in. I need to get it pumped out. So he goes ahead. He calls the maintenance guy up. Maintenance guy comes with a pump. He's going to pump it out. And I'm not picturing it at the time. And then he goes, uh, in order to get you out to the pit that you're going to, I'll, I'll have my head of security come and take you out there. So up, uh, up comes this big golf cart. It's a big multi-seater golf cart uh, made for transporting people. And here's this uh, young man. He's dressed in desert camouflage. He's got the bulletproof camouflage vest on. He's got uh, a sidearm and an M16. And uh, I ask him, I go, is there something that I should be aware of? <laughs> you know, because I thought it was a little bit of overkill there. And he goes, well, I just got back from the Middle East, and this is the way I used I dressed when I was in the Middle East. And I am just comfortable wearing this. So he brought something back with him that uh, it was probably still last and still yet today more than likely. That's the unfortunate part of sending our young people to different lands and sometimes into the military. Sometimes they bring back stuff that we really don't want to know about. So, but I wanted, to, like I say, I wanted to thank you for your service. So, uh, quarrying pipestone, like I say, we get to this pit. This pit is probably 20 foot long by about eight to 10 foot wide. And we're about 10 to 12 foot uh, deep. Have you guys seen the stone that's on the railroad track? Some of it's kind of purplish color. That's called uh, quartzite. Quartzite is one of the hardest stones out there. The pipe stone is under the quartzite. So, and there's about a foot of uh, topsoil that has to come off before we get to the quartzite. So we get down in this pit and there's about this much mud in the bottom of the pit. And we're, we know we're gonna get our shoes just full of mud. So we're down into this pit. My son grabs the big sledgehammer and he's gonna go to town on that quartzite. And he rears back with that sledgehammer and he just lays into it. <laughs> it was kind of humorous because if you can imagine somebody taking a sledgehammer and hitting a steel girder and that vibration. <laughs> yeah, he did that a few times. And I told him, no, we have to look for a fissure and use the wedge and crack it back that way. It was, it was something else because we got back to the uh, motel room that night. And I don't think he made it 10 foot in there and he was face down on that bed and he was out. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was an interesting trip. Let's say that. Um, I went to the uh, National Pipe Museum. I wanted to get my uh, pipes checked out because they tell me that the guy that made this pipe, he passed away in 1950 something. So it's a fairly old pipe. And then my, my personal pipe, the guy that made that died in the 70s. They're all signed, so they know who made them, and they know the time frame. And they got a good idea from the National Pipe Museum because the pipe carriers and pipe makers are all registered. So while we were at the National Museum, I see this odd-looking man who's got a white fur jacket on. And I used to trap when I was younger, and I can pick out a lot of the different furs. And I'm looking at that fur and I'm thinking, it looks like it might be a cow. And I, I have to know, I'm just, I have to know. And I ask him, uh, tell me what, uh, what kind of fur is your jacket? And he goes, uh, well, this was my goat. This is how I pay homage to my goat. I made a jacket out of him. So it was a white, white fur jacket made out of, and I got talking with this man. He was kind of interesting. One of the questions he asked me was if I brought my hand drum. And I go, well, how do you know I had a hand drum? Oh, I knew you were coming. And I kind of looked, you know, I'm, I'm a little surprised by that. 
And uh, I got talking with this man. I come to find out he's the medicine man, the local medicine man. And uh, medicine men have, uh, they have a lot of connection, a lot of connection with the spirit world. And uh, he was asking me if I brought my hand drum because he wanted to teach me some of the healing powers of the hand drum. Did you feel the resonance of the hand drum? He was telling me that his most frequent call that he goes on with his hand drum is to deliver babies. He gets in front of the woman and he'll sing a song and he'll speed the drum up, which speeds the mother's heartbeat up and the unborn baby's heartbeat up, and that induces labor. So he was telling me he has different songs for different things also, some for diabetes, some for pancreatic cancer, some for gallstones. He had different songs for different things. So he made the, the circuit doing this on the reservation. He, uh, he also told me he was uh, one day he was at Sundance and he's singing away and he's noticing this woman dancing and dancing and dancing around. And by the time he's done, she's standing next to him. And she goes, oh, that was beautiful. You sing like my uh, my husband used to. He passed away several years back. And he turns around and looks at her, says, oh, your husband didn't know what he was doing either. <laughs> so uh, I stood in that parking lot, and I think I talked for a couple hours easily. And I know I got my son very annoyed that we spent so long talking to this guy. But uh, it was really, I wish I would have got his name because I would like to catch up with that guy again sometime but I think it was a chance encounter that he knew that I was going to be talking with him uh it's like I say it surprised me so we had uh that was one of the experiences of having a vision to go up to Pipestone Minnesota and Corey Pipestone and then meeting that man like I say Pipestone is very sacred amongst the natives, so only Native Americans can quarry Pipestone in Pipestone, Minnesota. But if you go up there, you can buy Pipestone at some of the side shops because people bought the land around there and they quarry their own Pipestone. So it's it's not like Pipestone, Minnesota is the only place you can get it. We have uh, pipe carvers in my tribe. Almost every tribe has a pipe carver. So oldest musical native instruments like say the hand drum you heard the hand drum one of our local things that we we would do the rattle ceremonial rattle you notice it's made out of the turtle shell we as natives we we didn't let a lot go to waste because when we were given something it was a gift from the creator and it would be bad to not use everything so we used everything that we could. <clears throat> and then notice the last thing here is a flute. In my tribe, only the males are allowed to play the wooden flute. So the women can play the metal flute, but not the, not the metal or the wooden flute in our tribal stuff. So that's uh, the flute was used by men to court women, primarily. Uh, it's kind of a relaxing instrument. If you've noticed, the flute music is very relaxing. So it has a a kind of a a world of its own. I know when I practice with my flute, when I'm out in the woods, I'll be uh, cutting grass and I'll take a break. I'll sit down and I'll play the flute. And I'll notice all the birds come in and they come in and sit and listen. It's really kind of neat because they're coming to hear me play the flute, which is really interesting. And no music majors here, I hope, because that was a pretty horrible rendition, what I just did. So, 
I uh, I did that at the college. I asked, I go, anybody, any music majors here? And the one girl goes, I go, well, you, you heard the one note I missed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a lot of the high schools, they just continue, you know, giving me the applause because they don't know any better. <laughs> so, yeah, these are some of our oldest instruments. We didn't get our citizenship until June 2nd, 1924. Like say June second, nineteen twenty four. We were here well before that, but still yet politics plays into this yet because some of our tribal people didn't get to vote until nineteen fifty seven, and still yet today, in Minnesota and down in the Southwest, they still don't let them vote because the reservations are so big, they only get post office boxes because they don't they don't get a regular mail route. So they have to go to the post office. So they have a post office box. And according to the law, you have to have a, a physical address and have mail to deliver to you. Well, the postman is not going to drive 100 miles out into the desert to deliver mail. So that's uh, very unfortunate that they don't let the, our tribal people vote. World War One, even before... We were citizens of this country. We served in the military. Still yet today, the Native Americans per capita wise are the largest percentage of uh, people in the military. <clears throat> we join to find a better way. We send our young people into the military and sometimes they come back with things that we don't like. And it's still, even in the white society, it's the same way. Sometime our people come back with things that we don't care for. So American Indian soldiers were praised for their bravery. Uh, kind, of a, kind of goes with the white man's thinking that the natives were better at being at fighting and all of that. Well, a lot of them come from different society where even in Chicago here, the Chicago youth, I had a group of about 50. And out of the 50, only two have practiced their cultural ways. So I have to I have to remind them of who they are and what tribe they came they came from, and for them to explore their uh, ethnicity. So it's very important that they they do that. They learn uh, who they're who they are. You guys have probably done some background researches on who you are. So we were the original code talkers. Uh, the code talkers weren't just the, ro the romanticized Navajo. In World War I, we had plenty of war code talkers also. All the tribes had sent their young people into the service of the country, and they would talk in their native language. Because you'll hear about the different drum circles that they would have during uh, military times. So there's uh, if you go to a powwow, there's a thing called... Uh, 49ers, where the drum stays after and they sing songs honoring the veterans that went in. The original story starts out that there were, there were 50 men from this one reservation that went into the service. And of them 50 men, one of them decided to take a peek what was going on. Well, he stuck his head up and he got hit with a sniper and he got killed. There was 49 left. So they, them 49 get together and they would honor that one guy that was, that was shot. So... Uh, here is our hero from the Ho-Chunk Nation, Mitchell Red Cloud. He, uh, he won the Medal of Honor posthumously. He was mortally wounded, and he told uh, his fellow soldiers to tie him to a tree, leave him with a machine gun and some hand grenades. And he held off a battalion of Chinese in Korea long enough for his battalion to reestablish itself and defend the line. Today, in the Pacific Fleet, there is a troop carrier named the Mitchell Red Cloud. I was, uh, unfortunately, I had to work because I would like to have went to the naming. They invited everybody from the tribe to come out to see that, to, uh, the christening of that troop carrier, and I thought it would have been a special thing. So I wish I had a picture of it too, but I don't. 
Indian Religious Freedom Act. I remember when I was young, we would have Native American church at Star Rock. People would come down to Star Rock and we would have Native American church services. All the way up until 1978, they were, they were illegal to have. My mother would tell me, if anybody asks what's going on with all the cars, just tell them we're having a meeting. Still yet today, that is the code word for Native American church. It has lasted that long, the stigmatism of being illegal and hiding our religion. So when I hear some of my Native people talk, we're having a meeting Saturday night. I know they're having Native American church. So uh, it wasn't until uh, 1994 that we actually gained all of our religious freedom. The Native American church, some of the Native Amer groups of the Native American church still use peyote, and they have the provisions. I did that when I was young, and I didn't care for it because I seen people abuse it. Uh, I was taught to keep my body pure. So that's, uh, I don't do that. We have our choice as uh, natives. We, have, we can do, uh, in order to stop the raids on the Native American church, what they did was they put a Bible in there. And if you notice, this is the original Native American church when they did uh, with the peyote and that. And then over here, they still practice this here, and they just put a Bible on that uh, crescent there. So they have two ways of doing that yet. So one was with the Bible, where they cite a lot of Bible verses, and then the other was uh, the traditional way. And then we have another way with the sweat lodge. So I practice with sweat lodge, so I have to get my sweat lodge back up. But... Uh, like I say, we have religious freedom, just like you white people have your religious freedom. You're free to handle the snakes and drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> My wife tells me that joke's going to get me in trouble someday. Back in the uh, 1820s, and actually before that, but the 1820s was the renewed roundup of the Native Americans. The renewed roundup was to remove the Native Americans out of the Illinois, the Illinois Territory. So they start writing uh, treaties. This was one of the first treaty maps. And a lot of the treaties were redundant because they wrote the same treaties 38 different times because they forgot a tribe here or they forgot this or they forgot that. So this was the first treaty map. And like I was telling you, our Ho-Chunk people would have been, this would have been a good line, except it probably would have came back down through here. But this follows the river. The rivers were the highway for our tribal people. In the 1820s, the Illinois militia, which was volunteer at the time, uh, you could go home anytime you wanted. You were given a, a musket and you were fed and you were part of the Illinois militia. So just think about yourself. If you were in the Illinois militia and you had the roundup of the Native Americans and some of them would creep into the woods at night, would you go after them? Remember, you're a volunteer. <laughs> More than likely, you got a family to go back to. So that's how a lot of the different Native American settlements happened. In the 1830s, we had another uh, another map that was put out. All of these maps are online. This is your, if you look up Illinois Land Cessation Treaties, uh, they'll talk about the history of all the treaties, of why they did so many different ones, what they forgot to include, and how the natives really did not know what they were signing because the natives... I'm a, a next to their name, they put an X, and then two soldiers wrote their name down. So I guess that makes it right. <laughs> but if you notice this here, this line that goes across here, I am told that there is a road not too far from here. It's called Half Day Road. 
and that's the treaty line, one of the treaty lines. So, uh, and Half Day was the name of a Potawatomi chief. So it's not because it takes a half day to, <laughs> but there was a chief that was named Half Day. I learned this from my uh, optometrist. Let's say that he's, he's a historian. He loves history. It's unusual where I'll find these people at. And they love talking history. And he was telling me, he goes, we were taught that in school about Chief Half Day. And he goes, it's a shame that nobody teaches anything like that anymore. And he's an older gentleman also. So he's uh, about the same age as me. We're both old fogies. So <laughs> uh, it's interesting, like I say, what we what we come to find out, what history tells us. Like I say, the renewed uh, excitement to get all Native Americans out of Illinois in the 1830s was because of Black Hawk's uprising. He uh, gave up his land in Moline area on the Rock River and went across because they told him that the land in Iowa was just as good as the land in Illinois. Well, it wasn't. He gave it a year, he came back, and all of the settlers came in and divvied out his property. And he was threatened with violence if he didn't leave. So he went ahead and left. He went ahead and he went back up here, up to Stillman, Illinois. At Stillman, Illinois, uh, he realized that uh, the military was going to do violence against him. He didn't want to die fighting the military because he had too many old people, women, and children with him. So he sent six of his braves to go surrender, negotiate a surrender. So three of them stayed in the woods, three of them went up. They had the white flag, they walked up. You can imagine the young, well, let's just call them young gunslingers that uh, all they wanted to do was shoot an Indian. So I think we still have some of that still running around here today. So they, uh, they see these Indians coming up and they go ahead and shoot the guy with the white flag. They shoot the guy next to him and then they take the last one and they beat him to almost to death. And then they send him back, you know, as a, uh, as a warning to Black Hawk that, uh, no, you're going to be killed. We're not, we're not accepting your surrender. So Black Hawk, he was not a chief. He was a warrior. Black Hawk had about 80 of his warriors is all he had. He decided he would rather go down fighting. So there was 300 Illinois militia people. And then there was 80 of his people. He decided that next morning they were going to charge and go down fighting that Illinois militia group. They went ahead and they charged them. And that volunteer militia turn and run. It's still in the military history books today. Uh, it's called Stillman's Run. So they turned and ran, and some of the newspaper headlines was there was 3,000 bloodthirsty Indians. <laughs> you know, that's what they seen, They because they were running. <laughs> they weren't looking behind them too much. <laughs> so that, uh, that spurned a call to get the federal militia. Uh, in action. And in the meantime, Black Hawk realized he needed to get to Iowa, but he was going to go up through Wisconsin. He went up through Wisconsin. He took his time because uh, he seen that uh, the military was not equipped to do battle with them. He kind of sensed that. Well, in the meantime, they got a hold of the federal militia. Federal militia comes and they come to Fort Dearborn. And on the way there, they caught a bad case of cholera. So they were they were held up for a month in Chicago. Well, in that amount of time, Black Hawk goes up into Wisconsin. He's set up on a high hilltop, and the federal militia comes. And another thing that's wrote in the history books was 
how how much of a statistician or uh A strategist. How much of a good strategist that Black Hawk actually was? Because he set eight of his warriors to distract that federal militia. They were both on high points, and he had to go across the river in order to get to uh, in order to get to Iowa. So he sent eight of his warriors to distract this force of three thousand, and he went ahead. And those eight lost their lives, but they distracted that military long enough one day for his whole group of about 300 to cross that river that night. They said that same river that they had to cross, that the federal militia had to cross, took them over three weeks to cross that same river. So they had a pretty good head start. Well, the federal militia guy knew exactly where Black Hawk was headed. And he ordered a steamboat with a machine gun, or a Gatling gun, and he had cannons set up, and it was basically a slaughter. So uh, if you read some of the history books, they talk about how, how vicious some of the uh, federal militia people were, as uh, the women would put their babies in their little cradles and push them so they would be able to live, go across the river. And they talk about the young soldiers that would take target practice on the babies. So the rest of them were mowed down with the Gatling guns. And like I say, the, the media was embedded, so it was all recorded. So uh, Black Hawk and a few of his people escaped to the north, and he got rounded up eventually, and they kept him as a trophy. They took him to Washington, and they made they had audiences with different heads of state. He was like more of a show and tell piece. So that's how he lived his life out, kind of in shame. So um, I want to try to, uh, I want to go into a native tale. We'll, chant, we'll lighten it up a little bit here. Uh, let me do this right. A long time ago, long before the two leggeds were on this planet, on this turtle island, the crow was the most beautiful bird in the world. He had all the colors of the rainbow. He was the smartest bird out there. He had a voice second to none. He, he had a voice of like angels. So he was, a, he was a very respected bird. The head of the crow calls a council amongst all the other crows. And they sit together and they discuss th what they needed, what their, what their differences were, what, what needed to be resolved. And they went ahead and did that. And a lot of the things that they talked about could be resolved right then and there with this council meeting. But one of the older crows gets up and he speaks. He goes, at night, it is so dark out. Strange things rub against me. And in the morning, some of my friends and relatives are gone. So he, the head crow goes, well, I have a meeting with Mauna, the creator, next week. I will relay this message. So the head crow meets with uh, Mauna, and he relays that message. He goes, one of my uh, elders tells me that it's so dark at night, strange things rub against him, and in the morning, some of his family and friends are gone. And he goes, I know this. I am going to work on that. Let's meet back in 100 years, and I'll tell you what to do. So they get together. Uh, 100 years goes by back then. Just like that, time went by quite a bit faster back then. 100 years goes by, and the, uh, the crow meets with Mauna. Mauna tells him, gather as much of the sacred wood as you can. Because in the meantime, the creator had went out and seeded the whole countryside. 
But uh, Mauna tells the head crow, go out and pick up as much of this sacred wood as you can and take it to the highest peak. And uh, he goes, well, how will I know what the sacred wood is? It's the tree that snows in the summertime. And uh, he, he's still not getting it. He goes, it's the tree that has a star in the branch. Take as much as that as you can. Take it up to the highest point. But let me give you a warning. Whatever you do, do not touch the sacred fire. Again, let me tell you, do not touch the sacred fire or there will be dire consequences for you and your people. You know what I mean by dire consequences? It's when you don't listen to your mom. <laughs> so the crows gather up all this sacred wood and they take it up to the highest point and they go ahead and two months goes by and they've got all of the wood that they can gather there's no more laying on the ground so they decide to light the fire they light the fire and it's going really well so every time an ember would go up a spirit would come down and grab the ember and take it up into the sky. And it would create a star. And that's how the stars were put in the sky and how the moon came about. And all the stars there, from all them embers, the spirits took up into the sky. Well, after the fourth day, that fire kind of died down. They had crows looking at it. He sees an ash field. But he knows that that fire is probably not out. The fifth day comes by. His curiosity is getting to him. He's looking at that ash field, and he's thinking, I wonder if it's out. It doesn't look like there's anything going on. And he goes, well, I'll come back tomorrow. Sixth day comes by. He looks at it again, and he's, it's just driving him crazy to find out if this is burnt out or not. And then finally, the seventh day comes up, and he comes up to that ash field, and he's got to know. He puts his foot into that ash field, and sure enough, it's not out. That fire flares up, and it burns his feathers. His feathers start on fire. He dances around because he burned his foot. He dances around. It catches his tail, which catches all of his feathers on fire. He turns around again, and he breathes in all the hot gases, and it burns his throat. Just then... A big crack of thunder and lightning happened right next to the head crow. It's the creator. The creator showed up and he was not happy. He was not happy because he told him, I told you there would be dire consequences if you touch that sacred fire. You see how you are today? This is how you and your people will be from now and forever. And you see how your voice is? You see how your voice is? This will be the voice for the rest of your life. So that's why the crow can only go, ha, oh, oh. ha. <laughs> and that is why the crows are black and how the stars came into the sky. <laughs> we'll take questions now. Uh, yeah, that's one of my favorites. So that's why I, I put it in. I got a. I do a storytelling thing also with native stories. That's a good native story. So I do storytelling also where some of the stories have a lot more, uh, a lot of creationism. So uh, I know uh, maybe I'll do a quick, another quick story. Uh, another quick story is about, uh, let's see, we do have quite a few females here. Maybe I'll do that one instead. Uh, a reason to be humble. Uh, albinos in our tribe are thought to be very sacred and uh, we have uh, an albino that's born and uh, they're usually considered very sacred and they get special treatment while well, this albino girl she she knew she was special and uh, as she was growing up she would go to the lake every day 
and she would comb her hair in the reflection of the lake. And on her way to the lake, she figured out if she grabs some flowers and rubs it on herself, she's going to smell real nice. So she did this for quite a while. And then eventually the boys see her, and then they ask her, hey, would you like to go out with me? Would you like to hang out with me? Go away, go away. I can't be seen with you. Go away. And uh, she did this for years, years go by. And the next thing you know, the chief's son, really good uh, provider, he uh, he asked this young woman uh, to go out. And uh, she goes, no, 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 go away. You're too ugly. I don't want to be seen with you. Oh, go away. You're ugly. And uh, she goes ahead and she's combing her hair in the lake. And uh, the next thing you know, uh, one of the uh, rival chiefs, son comes up he's he's even better than her chief son so he's uh he's a lot better looking real muscular he goes up he's got all kinds of resources he's one of the best hunters out there one of the best providers and he goes up and uh, they know they would be a good match and he asks that young lady to go out would you like to go out with me i would like to marry you and uh she goes, no, go away, you're hideous, you're hideous, get away from me, you're hideous. So the uh, this goes on for quite a while, and uh, she's down at the lake combing her hair in the reflection of the lake. She's got the flowers she was rubbing on her to smell real nice. And the next thing you know, out of the woods comes this odd-looking man. And uh, he comes up to this young girl and a young woman at the time. And uh, he goes, I would like to marry you. And she goes, go away, you're too ugly. Oh, I can't be seen with you, you're so ugly. I can't be seen with you. And uh, it's right then and there that that, uh, that man should shed his man suit. He was actually the water spirit. I am sent here by the spirits to punish you for being the way you are. And uh, just then a crash of lightning and thunder happened. And the next thing you know, this girl starts shrinking down in size. Black hairs come all over her body. Black hairs grow through her head. And she has two streaks of white. And then uh, she shrunk down to about the size of a cat and her odors, her odor changed. And this is how skunks were created. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These are some of the native stories that we would traditionally tell anywhere from December through February. We would sit in our longhouse, like say in, in my presentation uh, on a different program, the storytelling, I set the mood by imagine you're in a longhouse with a big roaring fire going and then uh, shows a picture of the outside with the snow blowing and the the sound is with that with the wind blowing and all the snow going and I go we're sitting inside and we're gonna we're gonna tell stories Waka is what it's called in our tribal language Waka is storytelling so we would sit and tell stories it was said some of our stories would last up to five days long so some of the stories got really in depth and then some of our stories uh are boring <laughs> but i try to pick the ones out that have a moral it's like the dire consequences story so uh and i used that one yesterday with the kids at the school you know you, you guys know what dire consequences are that's when you don't listen to your teacher so <laughs> so uh, i'm available for questions yes well, it's like every religion has a God. Uh, ours is the same way. The creator, Mauna, it would be our God. So it created everything. Yeah. We're, uh, we're thankful every day for each day that the creator gives us. So Mauna, Mauna, M-A-U-N-A, Mauna. That's in ours. Every tribe probably has a little different thing but it's very similar so uh it's like my grandfather always said don't talk don't talk religion <laughs> so i go well if you bring it up the right way i think you could talk about it i'm not pressing my religion on you 
And uh, I think if it's brought up in that way, to, uh, Tecumseh had the, the speech about that. Uh, don't, uh, don't let people press their religion on you. Don't press it on them. Uh, be respectful. Uh, so, uh, you know, good words from an old, older, uh, and he was never a chief, but he was a Shawnee with the Shawnee tribe in Southern Illinois. Uh, yes. How many tribes are there in Illinois? <laughs> well, currently none. <laughs> yeah, we, they were all, we're not, there are no tribes recognized by the state of Illinois, but originally there would have probably been about 25 to 30. So there was all kinds of, and it changed so often because one of the things that uh, history will tell you, and uh, some of the tribes don't like to hear it, especially the Potawatomi. The Potawatomi were originally in Michigan, and they were driven over into Illinois by the Iroquois. The Iroquois taught the Potawatomi how to fight, and they moved into Illinois to avoid the you know the fighting and the bloodshed, but they learned how to fight and they killed off a lot of the rival tribes because most of the tribes down here were very peaceful. We were farmers, fishermen, hunters. We weren't a warring people. We we had no desire to go to war. So, and uh, it was it was a peaceful existence. So, because we were one with the nature. Languages worried about uh, how many languages are there? In the well, there's the Algonquin style language, which Potawatomi still have, and then there would be the Sioux, and they call it Sioux, I call it Ho Chunk language. <laughs> so, uh, that was just for in the Midwest here because uh, our language, even some of the northern tribes still would use our language. So, but there's a there's a uh, dialect difference. Uh, some of the words have changed over the years. So, but uh, if you listen hard, you can almost tell what they're saying. I can at least. So, when I was ten years old, we had to sit at the picnic table and learn how to speak Ho Chunk. Uh, I used to travel with my grandparents to quite a few of the powwows. I was their little helper. I was Junior's replacement. <laughs> Let's say that. So. I traveled with my grandparents to almost all of the functions. I am uh, following in my grandfather's footsteps as doing these programs. Uh, he used to come to Chicago, I remember, quite a bit and do these programs. So I'm following and uh, he would teach our cultural ways. So, uh, yes. Can women in the truck tell stories too? Or is yes, yeah, I learned uh, I learned some of my stories from my, uh, my auntie. I, and the word for ant in our tribal thing is chewy. So C-U-U-W-I, chewy. So that's, auntie means several things. She could be our replacement mother even. So my chewy down in, uh, she's down on the border of uh, Missouri and Oklahoma. She, uh, she taught me some of the, uh, some of the uh, stories also, but like I say, some of her stories are kind of boring. <laughs> I like to have action. These large reservations in different areas of the country. Do all Indians have the right to go and live on those reservations if they want to? No. <laughs> no. Uh, you have to be enrolled in that tribe in order to be able to do that. So we can't, uh, I can't go to any of the Sioux. You know, you, I would have to be part of that tribe. I am part of the Wisconsin Ho-Chunk. So soon uh, the Winnebago tribe in Winnebago, Nebraska will be changing their name to reflect the same difference that we did. So I was, I was named right before the name change in 1964. So I'm still called White Winnebago. So, uh, but we, we changed it over to Ho-Chunk. Ho-Chunk is mean uh, the lang, you know, the the people, the Ho Chunk Skaga Ska is white and Ga is a male name. So it's Ho Chunk Skaga. No, but uh, we uh, have some housing. I have to look into some housing here in North Chicago. We want to buy an apartment complex for our financially challenged young families. So uh, 
you know, it's, we're trying to look to build everybody up. Um, I want to try to do one thing I want to talk about real quick, like was don't be afraid to stop at any of our casinos. Our casinos do so much good for our tribe. The, uh, a lot of that money, you'd think we're just hoarding that money. We're not. We're putting that money back into our people, into our tribe for our cultural education. Uh, we have several schools in Wisconsin that teach Ho-Chunk language. They're public schools, but we fund those public schools with the monies from the casino. They take care of our elders' uh, health insurance. They take care of our youth, uh, not their primary source of funding. Uh, they have to show that they want to go back to school and they have to maintain a grade point average. And then the tribe will kick in for them to uh, be able to go to school. So I was fortunate. Uh, my son, he got the scholarship from the school because he had high grades. And then the tribe picked up a portion of that. And I got stuck with the most expensive part, uh, feeding him. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So there's some sources that say that Illinois, the word Illinois, are so French, so the French were coming in there. But then I read that Illini was actually tribe, and the Illinois is actually named after Illini, which is an Indian American tribe. And no, the Illinois were a coalition of tribes. So there was never really an Illini tribe. So it was a coalition of different tribes that banded together. They banded together because they had to fight off that Iroquois invasion that was coming. So they had to, they figured out that there was, they were better with numbers when they banded together because some of the tribes, they didn't have the resources or the numbers to defend against a, a well trained warring crowd. So once they had enough people together, they stood a better chance of fighting fighting with the bigger group. So no, that, yeah, it's a common history mistake. So, cause people ask, well, what about the Illini? Well, the Illini were a coalition. They were not actually a tribe. So, yeah. But they, but they existed under coalition that were. Yeah. Of... Yeah. Uh, they were all lumped in together in the, uh, 1830s first they were moved into missouri and then they were finally they were while well, they were moved three times they were moved into missouri then they were moved into kansas and then they were moved into uh oklahoma so and they all got renamed peoria the peoria tribe so it's uh kind of an unfortunate thing that you were too small to be recognized so well, we're just going to put you and make you part of the Peoria tribe. Well, it's kind of an unfortunate part of history there also. The yeah, the Kickapoo got pushed in with the Peoria tribe. Yeah, so that's currently today, that's uh, uh, they're all bundled in with the Peoria tribe. So. They're in Texas too. Did any of the tribes have a written language you mentioned in oral history? Not so much a written language. Uh, there is now with the pronunciations because we have about, there's right about six different vowels that we use in our language. Some some of the languages like the, the Potawatomi have their languages. I think there is no, no verbs in their language. So it's a, uh, but it's inflection of how it's used. So, uh, you know, I was, if you get it, you know, I hate to push, we're in a library, so I know you guys have access to book books. Uh, uh, Kimmer with uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Uh, if you get a chance, read that book. And she talks about the, learning the Potawatomi language. And she thought she couldn't learn it. And then finally it hit her like a brick wall. One day she goes, now it all makes sense. <laughs> so she was one of the few that speak it yet. So we have our, our language classes are online now. Uh, organization is difficult because 
I don't know what, what the problem is anymore. Uh, people, uh, we have these scheduled language classes and the next thing you know, they're canceled. <laughs> so it would be nice if they had a regular language class. I'm pushing to see if we can get a language class here in Chicago because we have a Chicago office. In Illinois, we have uh, property. Our Ho-Chunk Nation does. We have a Chicago office. We have a sports complex down by Crete. And then uh, we have tribal property at Star Rock. So uh, we re-intern our native graves, our people, into our tribal property. The state has allotted some property finally. It was in the bill that they signed back in August. They're going to have uh, some state allotted property. Uh, you know, my only problem with that is because Illinois has the most native remains in all of the museums out of all of the states. So, and they all have to be reinterned, given back to the tribes. So, but the state came up with some uh, property for them to do that. My only problem with that was we were reinterned them in our property already. I think that some of the other tribes, if they want to lay claim to Illinois, they need to buy property in Illinois and bury their people. So you just can't build your casino and ignore the people that are un, that are not buried. So it's, it's, it's a balancing act. We're doing it the right way. Uh, you had. So, from the regalia from the U of I, Illini came from the Sioux. Why not from Homechunk? The, the regalia that uh, the person from the, that they do at U of I is nothing that we've ever seen. Let's say that. It's not the, uh, a lot of these sports teams, uh, like the Florida State Seminoles, they have compacts with that tribe. Uh, Boise State, I think, has a compact with the tribe or the, the Utes. They have a compact with the Ute tribe. So Illinois would have to reach out to one of the tribes. And since there are no tribes uh, recognized as indigenous to Illinois by the state of Illinois, the uh, university will probably not do that. So it's a political thing. I do have another question. So... Uh... Karen is wondering, does the Ho-Chunk tribe participate in powwows? Yes, yes. Uh, at least once a month. <laughs> we have powwows all over the place. Uh, we sponsor some of the powwows here in Chicago, but uh, we have powwow grounds uh, at quite a few places in Wisconsin. Our main powwow ground is up at Black River Falls. That's where our tribal headquarters is. There's uh, tribal powwow grounds up in... Uh, Baraboo, Wisconsin, uh, all over the state, there's there's different powwow grounds. We participate in uh, the uh, fest in Milwaukee also. So we're one of the sponsors, let's say that. Like I say, the money that's raised from the casinos is well spent uh, on re-educating our youth and promoting our cultural ways So so we don't lose our ways. So... Uh, any other questions? Yes. What kind of bones are in your house? Back in the day, they would have been buffalo. So, but these are deer. So, they would be. Uh, this uh, choker was real old. Uh, my grandmother gave me this. She made it when I was probably about thirteen, somewhere in there. So it's. I had to restring it once. But, uh, and this here was made for me by uh, a Sioux guy. And he, I have a feeling uh, some of it might be Buffalo. So, but I ran into him, he, me and him got along and I had to try to educate him on his lifestyle because I went out to eat with him and he ate everything. I go, uh, you can't be doing that. Uh, he had a, he had a sad story too. So he was a police officer and was, went out on a call and uh, it was a bad car accident and he found out it was his wife and she had she was killed in that car accident and he went off the deep end and become an alcoholic and now he's a drug and alcohol uh, counselor so yeah 
Ah, uh, because I, uh, well, it's sad that he lost his wife and he lost his way for a while. So, but I went and blessed his offices one day and uh, he's helped me out and I've helped him out. So uh, he helped me out with uh, getting my son some eagle feathers. So, and then uh, I've helped him out by blessing his office and uh, getting him some jobs. So. The federal repository in Minnesota, you have to apply, you have to be a Native American, you have to send your tribal ID in, a copy of it, and then you're on a waiting list because the eagles were not very, there weren't very many of them because there was, at one point in time, there was a 10-year waiting list. So, uh, but now I guess there's more that are being more eagles out there now. And uh, they say it's only about a couple year waiting list. So, and like I say, you have to have your tribal ID. So he wouldn't give those to just anybody. So let's say that. It's just magnificent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was told by one of the tribal elders, I was showing him some pictures and he goes, you've got a golden eagle bonnet and that's, a higher status than the uh, the bald eagle. So I go, I did not know that. <laughs> I didn't know there was a difference. Yeah, yeah the, there's more white in the uh, in the uh, bald eagle, and then the golden eagle. You can see it's it's got the flex. Yeah. Does it represent anything? Yeah, I'm a, I'm in the bear clan. Uh, if you get a chance, come up here and feel these bear claws, because these bear claws are not sharp, but it tells you the the uh, strength of the bear. So you know, I'm a I'm a bear clan chief. So, uh, and if there's any press here, I am not the chief of the tribe. Let's. I want to make sure I tell everybody that because I don't need to get another nasty phone call from the tribe saying, "Oh, they said you're the chief of the tribe." No, we have a traditional chief. And uh, no, I'm just a, I'm a lower level, a lot lower level chief. So, how, how does he become the chief? Who? Whoever becomes the chief. Oh, the traditional one uh, is because of his family name. It runs through his family, the traditional chief. So that's a uh, Winnishik family. So, but uh, my uh, my grandfather, like I say, we're matriarchal society. So the eldest daughter's first boy becomes the next chief but you can become a chief in other ways by some of your lifetime achievements so anything else